All right, I know some folks are still trickling in, but uh, there's no time to lose because we've got a lot of content lined up for y'all this, uh, this fine, mildly cloudy day in Austin, Texas. Uh, woo, welcome to DevOps Days Austin 2016, our fifth annual uh, DevOps Days event here in uh, the capital of the world. Yeah. We, we've come a long way in five years. Absolutely. Uh, what do y'all think of our new venue? So, some people are still out in the parking lot trying to figure out how to get to the new yes. venue, or, or still at the, the Marchesa, uh, you know, or like, wandering around the perimeter of the uh, yeah. stadium, banging on doors. But, but I'm sure they'll all make their way here. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, who's, who's here for your first uh, DevOps days? Ah, oh, outstanding, wow. a lot of new folks. And who's here from uh, out of town? All right, All right. well, uh, feel free and ask an Austinite if you need uh, help with anything. We don't bite, so we're all kind of hippie and stuff, is what I hear. Um, and how many people have been here for more than, like been to this Austin DevOps days for more than like three years? All right, who's been to all five? All right, we got some hands there, the, the, the old timers. All right, good. Great. Well, so uh, this, uh, this is a special event, not just because we've uh, kind of upsized our venue, but uh, we have some additional things going on this year. Um, if uh, you're interested in participating in the hackathon uh, at 10 a.m., uh, team formation and kind of the kickoff is gonna be down there in uh, that wing of this area, which is called the Touchdown Club for reference. Uh, but down there, uh, 10 o'clock hackathon, uh, there will be a uh, $1,000 uh, top prize uh, for the winning team. Uh, you'll be... And I think there's a everybody gets a prize prize too. Like it's no. a trophy for everybody? No. No, no, no. There, there is a little something for everybody. Well, a little something. But... Yeah. but uh, there you go. Get a drink. There you go. Exactly. Uh, so uh, feel free and participate in that. Uh, the, the, essentially, it's pick a DevOps problem and solve it. Uh, and the one that, uh, you know solves the most problem uh, wins. Um, so we're excited about that. We've also expanded two, three content tracks this year. Yep. Uh, there's a core track, a culture track, and a containers track, uh, mainly because we got so many, uh, so many talks I proposed about containers. I can't really contain containers. my yeah. excitement. I can't contain it. <laughs> uh, so we could not contain all of those talks, so uh, we put them in a track, so now they're contained. Great. Um, okay, and uh, so today, this morning, for our breakfast, uh, it's sponsored by PagerDuty. And uh, our lunch uh, is sponsored by Alien Vault. It's going to be some Black's barbecue. So if you, if you are uh, out from out of town, you are in luck because you're going to have some good barbecue here today. And then our happy hour today is uh, sponsored by Chef. And we really appreciate Chef's uh, involvement with that. And we're going to have, uh, I think it's going to be right here, right? Yeah, right, right here, uh, this bar. Uh, all right, and let's see, what, what else do we have on the, the list there? Is that pretty much uh, it? Food, uh, so the, the hackathon's down there. Food in the sponsor rooms are uh, down there. Uh, so in a, in a uh, uh, transparent bid to make you go look at uh, the vendor tables, uh, all the food is going to be placed next to them, and that's uh, down in that wing of the Touchdown Club. Um, you're going to have some initial some initial finding your way around uh, because of uh, the size of the venue. So like I mentioned, this is the Touchdown Club. We're gonna be doing the core track in here in the morning, uh, and we're going to be doing the uh, container and culture tracks in the Centennial Room, uh, which you will go up either set of the stairs, and you will wind your way around because it's basically on that flank of the stadium over there, and we'll have signs and volunteers posted to help you find your way. Um, also, upstairs, kind of right above us, that you can also take those uh, uh, stairs to uh, are, are suites. They're like the high roller suites that rich alumni used to watch the games, but we've rented them out uh, for open spaces, but also one of them is the green room. So if you're a speaker, uh, there's a green room up there that you can use. Uh, and one of them is dedicated to user groups. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do with DevOps Days this year is have it not just be a kind of one-time event, but use it to help people hook into uh, the local Austin technical community, 
more. So we invited a bunch of the uh, local tech user groups to do uh, either presentations or just meet and greets uh, in one of those suites. And those are all on the, uh, on the schedule. So if you look at that and you're like, oh, I'm interested in Dr. Austin or whatever, you can uh, uh, go up and meet some of the folks from that uh, organization in that suite. I'm worried about this speaker up here. So, okay, uh, all the volunteers, uh, would y'all stand up real quick? So, because it's a new venue, and uh, oh yeah, um, because because we're in a, a new venue, and uh, you know things aren't going to go as smooth as, as they always have. So we asked for everybody to be a little flexible. Uh, I mean, I know the DevOps days crowds are pretty uh, good about that, anyways. Um, but ask, ask the volunteers to help, and we'll try to help in any way that we possibly can um, to make that happen. So uh, y'all are going to be real busy uh, for this time. So, uh, all right. So let's see. What is there anything else we need to? Uh, Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is. Uh, oh man, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation because I was just correct, corrected for how I normally pronounce it. But Xenos is is pronounced is uh, is uh, sponsoring Wi-Fi. Um, and uh, I think the code is flashing up on the screen every now and then, so snap a picture of it, and you be should be able to get going on that. Yeah, and there's a couple signs around if you see uh, the, the see the Xenos logo and then a bunch of text. It's not some random advertisement. It's the Wi-Fi information, so uh, feel free and type it in. Yeah. Cool. Karthik, anything else? No? Okay. Well, so uh, I I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker, which uh, is Ernest. Uh, and uh, so... It's, uh, it actually took us a little while to get Ernest to agree to this. We started a Twitter campaign with the, with the hashtag, uh, and we, we started like asking uh, other people to say, hey, Ernest, I heard you're speaking. And, and uh, somewhere along the way, he eventually caved in and, and said. <laughs> and we thought Ernest would be a really good choice because Ernest has written um, the What is DevOps uh, blog post, which is like the most uh, widely read uh, definition on uh, on DevOps uh, on the internet or in existence uh, today. It's like the top search result when you just like search for DevOps or what is DevOps or whatever. So he really has done a great job uh, through his career and over the last uh, really five years is kind of the formation of DevOps uh, of really kind of bringing uh, new people into the fold and, and kind of helping, uh, helping us grow our community. Uh, as you can see here in Austin, we're really hoping to like, continue to grow our community. That's why we moved to this bigger venue. We're really trying to, to expand to that. Um, also, Ernest is a really good friend of mine. He's uh, the smartest guy that I know, and uh, he's uh, a very uh, kind and uh, wonderful guy. So, Ernest, to you, man. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, well, hello, and uh, it's good to, good to see everybody out at another DevOps Days Austin. Uh, I'm honored to uh, have been asked to, to deliver the keynote. We were, we were searching around for people and you know, started hitting up and being like, okay, there's the, you know, we need to bring in some of the folks we've had before and some new blood and all this. And after a while, they, uh, they got tired of that and demanded that I do it. So <laughs> I was like, all right. Um, uh, those of you that uh, don't know me, uh, hi, I'm Ernest. Uh, I'm Lean Systems Manager at Alien Vault uh, here in town. Um, myself and a number of my other longtime colleagues, uh, James, Karthik, Peiko, we all blog at uh, theagileadmin.com. Um, I've been here in Austin for 14 years, and I've seen the technical community uh, grow and develop and attract world-class employers and spawn successful startups and uh, really, really just uh, expand greatly over that time. Uh, DevOps came to us here at kind of early at Ops Camp uh, 2010, and we've had people practicing DevOps and innovating along with each other since then. Uh, and you know, while DevOps has become a respected worldwide phenomenon, it's also uh, it's also really taken hold in the Austin community. So I'm happy to report that the state of the DevOps union is strong. If you're required to say that in the State of the Union address, uh, but uh, but. As a, random, uh, as a random data point to prove that, that's a Google Trends graph of uh, searches for DevOps, right? It's, it's gotten uh, press and publications all the way up to Fortune Magazine and CIO Magazine. Uh, a, year, a year ago, CIO Magazine uh, wrote an article called Why Fortune 1000 CIOs and CEOs Should Make DevOps Investments a Priority Now. 
right? So uh, this, this started off as a little bit more of a grassroots uh, practitioner thing, but uh, uh, some you know, very, very large uh, organizations are starting to see the benefits from it. Industry analysts have sectors for it, uh, vendors all the way up to IBM, Dell, and Microsoft are addressing the space. I won't pass any value judgments, but uh, they say the DevOps and sell you stuff. Um, so one of the things that I think is the most exciting developments in DevOps this year is that we kind of have some harder data proving its benefits, all right? So um, the, uh, the uh, Puppet Labs and IT Revolution uh, State of DevOps report has been going for a number of years, uh, and uh, they actually hired uh, data scientist Nicole Fosgren to you know, turn it into a statistically significant study on, on these various uh, topics. And they, you know, they have data that proves you know, beyond a statistical uh, 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 confidence level that uh, organizations that are deploying more quickly uh, and doing these things, they, they are more successful both as IT organizations, but also more successful with business outcomes. Um, and continuous delivery, lean practices, these, these directly correlate with having success. And they also found some interesting things like it doesn't matter what kind of application you're working on. They, you always hear a lot of uh, things tossed out. I mean, you hear them about every, technolo every technological innovation. I'm, I'm old enough, I was here when the web started and you heard the same, same sort of nonsense back then about what. Well, that's just for the new cool kids, or we call them unicorns now in DevOps land because for whatever reason. Uh, uh, but as long as, you've, as long as you get your app to a point where it's testable and deployable, you can actually reap all of these benefits. Uh, and I was at DevOps Enterprise Summit uh, uh, last year, and you know, these are the sort of companies that are presenting about the benefits they're getting from from DevOps, right? Scaling to meet demand, increasing their pace to keep up with their business goals, reducing defects. You know, it's uh, it's not the unicorns, it's the Capital Ones and the stuff like that that, you know, are they're moved enough to come out and do presentations about how much this is helping. So many of us that have been practicing DevOps for a while, like we we quote know this, right? But this is essentially proof that we found, we found a new kind of revolutionary change. So this is the standard product management iron triangle, right? Scope, schedule, cost, quality in the middle. Uh, and without a revolution, everything you do is trade-offs within that. But kind of using, using DevOps techniques, you know, you can go faster and that actually improves your quality. You can use resources more efficiently. You can essentially set a whole new baseline for, uh, for this triangle. So that's, that to me is, you know, those of us that have been doing it are like, okay, well now, now I have proven what it is I'm doing has been good, but whatever, I already knew that. But I think it's significant for DevOps as an overall, you know, overall movement in the industry. Uh, so that's kind of abstract and high level. So now let's talk about what's, what's really new in DevOps this year and why people are excited. So, one of the best ways to keep up with what's new and interesting is actually to keep an eye on what, uh, what our DevOps founding fathers are up to. Uh, <laughs> they're keeping it fresh, uh, just like Hamilton, right? So uh, Patrick Dubois is uh, working on bringing DevOps to mobile. Uh, John Willis is working for uh, Docker and innovating around containers. Uh, Andrew, uh, along with uh, Cote, who I think is here, he better be because he's speaking later on, uh, is uh, pushing the sorcery of platform as a service forward. Uh, Damon is continuing to do, uh, do his work on bringing DevOps into the enterprise. Uh, so so the, you know, they're always pushing along the leading edge, them and you know, John Allspaw, Jez Humble, like our, our founding fathers are still with us uh, and so uh, they're the they're the great uh, great folks to follow. Of those, probably uh, it's it's obvious to uh, anybody that follows anything that the, the biggest news is containers still, right? Uh, which 
it kind of has been for the last two years or so. Uh, so what's, what's different about it this year? Um, more people have had time to actually build up container-oriented infrastructures and live in them for a little while, right? Uh, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the talks and uh, uh, techniques around containers over the last two years have been a little bit more speculative, a little bit more bleeding edge, you know, the, well, maybe you don't want to use this in production yet sort of thing. Uh, but that's, that's essentially passed by, right? So there, there are a lot of people using them, uh, using them in production. Um, we, we had so many, uh, as we mentioned, we had so many container talks proposed that we uh, set up a whole track for them. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the, who's, who's kind of real familiar with containers, you know, used them, understand what's going on. Okay, great, so still a, still a subset. So the, the, it's, it's great that we've got a bunch of talks on it. Um, my thoughts on why, why this is such a transformative technology, right? So there are the things that you, there's the things you hear when people first start talking about it, right? Uh, it's, it's an easy way to go cross-platform. It's lighter than VMs and gets you, uh, uh, get you better kind of efficiency in your infrastructure. Those are fine, but those aren't, those aren't why everybody's freaking the hell out about containers, right? That's, that's why everybody would freak out about some new VMware release that used up, you know, whatever, 50, 50 gigs less RAM to do whatever it is it does. Um, it's really a combination of the fact that it's developer and application friendly packaging, right? So it, it takes that, it takes that traditional duality of, well, developers writing code, then some other operations person is gonna interact with the packaging uh, and turns it into, you know, shifts it left, right? And turns it into something that's done on the developer desktop. Um, it opens up a lot of new, new slash old, right? Nothing's ever uh, uh, truly new, but new ways of thinking about configuration management, uh, immutable infrastructure, immutable delivery. Uh, these are things that folks like Adrian Cockcroft and Netflix kind of uh, uh, started doing in the cloud world, but it didn't necessarily, that wasn't necessarily the solution to, for everyone uh, because the cloud, while a lot faster than traditional, uh, uh, traditional technologies was still a little, a little big and lumpy, uh, but with containers, right, you start needing true service management and you start being able to abstract your systems up another layer, right? I mean, everybody's freaking out about containers right now, but in several, several years, it'll just be an underlying technology. You don't really talk about that much. Yeah, you know, there's like, ooh, the Linux process model. Like nobody, I mean, okay, there are a couple people that still geek out about that nowadays, but, but, uh, but you know, you, not, not, you know, tens of thousands of them, right? Uh, uh, and this is something where just, it's that, it's like object-oriented development, right? It's that, it's that next level. Uh, instead of the level being the process or the, or the deb file or RPM or, you know, whatever artifact you put into Artifactory, right? The way we interact with our systems is just moving up a level of abstraction, which always lets you do uh, a lot more a lot more interesting things. So the, what's coming in the year to come, right, uh, are container technology is gonna continue to push immutable delivery and service orchestration. Um, but kind of funnily, the, the pace of technological change keeps getting faster and faster and we have uh, unikernel technology and AWS Lambda and other uh, kind of serverless applications that uh, already moving to potentially displace a lot of container uses uh, with a, uh, you know, a even lighter approach to the system, which is to to not specifically care about it, right? Um, the other uh, the other thing is the security world. Who, who here is is in security or works does a lot of security work? Okay, so. The adjacency of DevOps and security has uh, grown very significantly. Uh, James had a large role in starting the, the rugged software movement a number of years ago, which was kind of that first injection of DevOps thinking into security. Uh, and it's really taken off. So, I mean, we just, we just spoke on lean security at RSA. They had a whole, DevOps.com sponsored a whole 
DevOps track uh, at RSA uh, uh, a couple months ago. So uh, the so many of those security problems are really just a combination of application and system problems, right? I mean, except for the except for the bean counting and making a lovely PCI report, like the security problems are systems problems. Uh, and the fact that that got split out to, well, here's all the people doing the actual work and then here's some security people over here that can somehow magically make that secure, right? Like, that's obviously an anti-pattern. I won't, I won't, you know, uh, uh, shuck and jive about that. Like, that, that's obviously an anti-pattern. And it's one that the uh, security industry is starting to try to look past. So those are kind of the, the good things that, that are going on. But I also wanted to talk about the things that I think are holding DevOps back a little bit, right? And get y'all's uh, get y'all's help on. Um, so the culture we're in frequently lionizes conflict, right? Uh, drawing lines, fighting for turf, being a giant ass. This is seen as a path to success on, on our TV screens every night, right? Uh, meanwhile, you know, in DevOps, we're like, collaboration, it's all good, right? But it's a little bit of swimming upstream. I mean, it, who here still feels like they have some sort of us versus them problem in their organization between Dev and Ops or with QA or with some you know, management, right? Exactly. Yeah, but on the other hand, so who's kind of sick of DevOps culture talks? Okay, so me too, right? So a lot of them are very basic and not actionable, right? So it, we've carefully curated the talks here, so hopefully there's not gonna be another, you know, Dev and Ops, go out and have beers together. It's all fixed, right? Like, yeah, that's, that's not, it's not a very uh, uh, sophisticated approach to culture change, right? Um, so how really do you do things like combat burnout? How do you build a learning organization, right? So these are advanced level culture topics that are really where the, the rubber meets the road. Uh, and while we need to remember that culture is the most important driver for success with DevOps, um, you know, the more, the more shops I see, one of the, one of the advantages of uh, kind of helping out with the community and running events like this is, you know, I get to work in some shops, but I get to interact with people and, you know, get a view inside a lot of other shops. And it's become clear to me that real, real openness, real collaboration, uh, you know, taking things along a, a lean perspective, adopting blameless culture, these are all way more important to success than what cool new tech you're using. Uh, but people are having trouble understanding, well, how really do I get from, from here to there, right? Um, so problem number two, uh, and this is something that became clear to me at last year's DevOps days is, is uh, where's the developers? There's where's Waldo. Who, who here would categorize themselves as a developer? Okay, and that's great. We're good to have you here. But notice that that's less than 50%, right? So. Um, Last year's DevOps days was the first year where the attendee mix started to skew very strongly ops, right? And so have a lot of the user groups. Um, this year we, we took care to add more dev content to the content tracks and add a hackathon. DevOps Days London uh, similarly added a hackathon to try to bring them back because keeping everyone engaged is the only way to be successful. Um, and I don't know the answer, are devs leaving because they're bored or have they, you know, do they think some of these tools have solved the problem? You know, are they drunk the no-ops Kool-Aid from somebody, right? Um, Mark Kerfee, so who's familiar with OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project? So it's a, it's a web application security organization formed to develop secure applications, right? And its founder, uh, Mark Kerfee, in 2011, you know, wrote kind of a, you know, nail to the door encyclical called, you know, OWASP hasn't reached a tipping point, talking about how that organization, it started off, you know, as a thing for developers, but eventually got co-opted by security professionals, security vendors, stuff like that, and just developers stopped coming, right? Uh, and he said, hey, the only way we can succeed is to have developers that know security. Like, without that, 
all this other stuff, while it might be good, is, is going to fail, right? Uh, and you know, the organization just became a haven for, for uh, the practitioners and vendors. We don't want the same thing to happen to DevOps, right? I mean, we, part of what, part of the uh, inspiration that spawned this was we realized, hey, you know, I, mean, I realized this personally, running a team at National Instruments with a bunch of real high, high uh, class uh, uh, systems people, like, we did a real good job and it still wasn't good enough. Like there was something missing and we finally realized we couldn't do that by ourselves, right? We developers, QA, product managers, security network, we need them all to work together to solve the problems that we face. Uh, because as we know, like extensive automation and tooling, it can cause as much damage as it can better our lives, right? Uh, when you have all your systems automated, you're, you're one command line away from uh, trashing it all. Um, and so, so we're kind of at risk, right? So there's people out there uh, peddling no ops, peddling bimodal IT, uh, other philosophies that essentially deny the operational needs of our systems, right? Uh, and, and that's something we see happen, right? So shoving a bunch of unknown packages into a container, you know, on a dev desktop and then throwing it out to, produc to production without any uh, without any review or thinking about the monitoring or security of it, like that's a potential outcome of all this new tooling if we don't all work together. Uh, we need all of the actors in the software delivery chain uh, to understand kind of philosophically what's required to make operable software and not use new tools to just create a new level of uh, chaos. Uh, uh, Karthik calls this going YOLO with containers. Uh, <laughs> that's what the kids nowadays say. Uh, so uh, that leads us to education, right? So one of the things that I've found disappointing over time is that a lot of people, including some prominent DevOps trailblazers, scoff at education, right? They say, DevOps can't be defined. You can't teach culture. And they say that like that's, a, uh, like that's words that make sense, right? But so, uh, I know many of us have had uh, indifferent experiences with like IT certifications, but to say you can't educate, I'll be blunt, it's ignorant and anti-intellectual at best, right? What is culture if not learned? You know, when, when I was fresh out of school, my first job was at FedEx Corporate IT in Memphis, Tennessee, and we went through six weeks of training starting off, and it wasn't technical training, it was culture training, right? It was personality types, it was collaboration, like they had a whole suite of courses to teach you culture. It's not impossible, right? Uh, and I, I find it very puzzling that, uh, that people think that way, but unfortunately it's had its effect. I, there's only a handful of good like DevOps books, right? You, you have other adjacent books that are interesting. I mean, uh, luckily, so Catherine Daniels and Jennifer Davis's Effective DevOps uh, just came out this year and Gene Kim and I think John Willis and other folks are collaborating on the DevOps cookbook and that's coming out soon finally. Uh, but you know, this is something where strangely we don't have a lot of education around, uh, around DevOps and that's one of the reasons beside our venue change for our DevOps University theme this year. Uh, these things can be taught, they can be written about in non-Twitter form, right? Uh, d do your part to make that happen, uh, fellow Fellow Agile admin James and I are uh, we're working on a DevOps course for Lynda.com, right? Uh, the, these topics need to be part of software development curricula. I mean, what one of the interesting dichotomies between Dev and Ops has always been that, you know, developers tend to be taught in college and colleges tend to not teach operations and you just learn it on the streets, right? Uh, and those are those are things that we we need to change and they can be changed. And those that claim you can't do that, I don't know, have a high opinion of that. Um, because one of the things that's really, that, that holds us back fundamentally is that we're, we're limited by what we're ready to understand, right? And I see this all the time in the technical industry. Like, so you know whenever anything new comes out and somebody's like, oh, that was invented in Bell Labs in 1970 or whatever, like, they're right. But the problem is, up until that point, only the Poindexters could adopt it, right? So containerization technology 
has been in there for a long time, but it took both, both commoditization in the form of Docker and stuff like that, but also just people getting to the point where they've passed through virtualization, they've passed through cloud, they're ready to understand it, right, that causes it to, to take off. Um, uh, when, uh, when James Karthik Paco and I were working at National Instruments, we, we created our own kind of model-driven automated infrastructure tool there. And we thought, hey, this is snazzy. This solves a lot of problems. Uh, John Willis came in. He was working at Chef at the time. And he looked at it. He's like, yeah, this is awesome. You know, and they went back. He's like, yeah, I tried to explain it to other people. And like, they didn't get it, right? So it's funny, because now we're seeing what we did then. Like, it looks exactly like all these new container orchestration things, Mesos, Kubernetes, and all that. But just people weren't weren't ready to understand that yet. And so that's why kind of education, all that is important. Um, a, another example, right, uh, a lot of people uh, uh, talk bad about monitoring, and there's a monitoring sucks hashtag that pops up from time to time. But what they mean, so allow me to translate, what they mean by this is most of the tools suck because all they do, all they do is pull data, right? For monitoring, you really want meaningful analytics, you want statistical process control, you want actionable alerting, you need run book automation, right? Like you, those things are what make monitoring, monitoring. Uh, and we've been hearing at conferences for years. So I've been going to like the Velocity Conference since it started. And you sit there and you watch, you watch presentations are like averages. If you're, if you're looking at a graph that has an average on it, You've got two problems, and one of them is that you're stupid, right? And you know you should be using Holt Winter's dynamic baselining for you know all this stuff, and we've been hearing that for years, right? But so few of the tools do that. I'm actually uh, excited. A couple of our vendors this year, uh, our sponsors, have some things that are finally starting to incorporate that. But why don't the tools have that? It's not because they can't do it. It's because people aren't ready for it. Uh, when one of the Agile admins, Peco, works for uh, Riverbed on an APM product, and it's been interesting hearing him talk about what products they, what features they've had to put in or take out of the product, just because people don't, people don't get it, right? It's like, uh, uh, and you, we don't need everybody to be an electrical engineer, right? So um, everybody doesn't have to understand signal processing. But we need some people that understand it and can put it in tools. And then we need some people that can understand it enough to at least explain to everybody how to interpret that if you're setting up, you know, you're setting up graphs and alerting in your monitoring tool, right? Um, so while DevOps is going gangbusters, to keep it healthy and to keep things getting better, we need to continue to bring everybody to the table and seek out a diversity of opinions. Right, so we need to learn from other disciplines, whether it's Dr. Richard Cook's How Complex Systems Fail, or Ron Weston's uh, Topography of Organizational Cultures, right? And you see other, other DevOps practitioners writing about these things as they, as they uh, discover them and pull them in from other disciplines. Uh, and by bringing everybody together, we can continue to innovate and succeed uh, for, as Ben Franklin said, we must all hang together, or assuredly, we will all hang separately. So I, I couldn't have done this talk without all the people that have shared their knowledge and insights with me from their own DevOps journeys. Um, feel free to reach out uh, to me to talk about your own DevOps challenges and successes. Uh, uh, one of the reasons we have DevOps days and the user groups and stuff like that is to uh, connect people with, you know, with people that can help them and get them the information they need. Uh, and with that, enjoy the conference. All right, so next up, we have, uh, we're, we're gonna take a little break, right? And then find your way to the uh, track you wanna do. So, uh, I'm sorry? 10.05. At 10.05, core track is gonna start in here, uh, and the culture and container tracks will be down around in the centennial room. You go, you go up the stairs a level and follow uh, uh, signs and uh, volunteers around. Sorry, I was late to pull up the schedule here. Hey, that was great. Oh, Thank sorry. you.